Hey guys, Joseph Babai Fa here on the channel, connecting you to your destiny once again, coming at you with a new video today. Can the sons of Ogum do Ifa? If you haven't had the chance, please go ahead and tap on that subscribe button. Ifa, when we're talking about the priesthood of Awo or Babalawo, it is a bit more selective than that of Olorisha or possibly other priesthoods within the Afro-Cuban or diasporic faiths, right? Um, there are certain characteristics the man has to have. But let's say the man fulfills all those characteristics and um, he is a son of Ogun. Now, for the longest time, there was this stigma that the sons of Ogun could not do Ifa, right? Now, the real basis of this within the Afro-Cuban tradition was a pataki that is present in the Odu Iroso Tualara or Iroso Otura. And what happened here was is that Ogun was a blacksmith and he was Obatala's son and he would confection, you know, uh, iron implements and things like that, like his profession um, entailed. And he would see Orumila consulting and he saw that Orumila didn't have to work hard per se physically to be able to make a living. And, you know, he really admired Orula and all of his characteristics, his knowledge, his interpretive skill. And Ogum said, I want to be a Babalao. And he went to Orumila and he expressed his interest. Money really wasn't an issue. He would pay for the ceremony, you know, uh, handsomely. Um, you know, and Orumila moved forward because Ogun was a heterosexual gentleman. Um, he did not come into trance with neither Orisha or Egun. And um, apart from that, I mean, there was nothing that really inhibited him from doing that, at least to Orumila's, um, you know, perspective. Now, Ogun, when he actually was consecrated as a Babalao, started confectioning his items or tools of Ifa out of iron, right? And they were very beautiful. But the issue was, is every time he would throw the opele, or the chain, it would make a, a clanking sound. You know, it, it sounded like a car crash, you know, in some scripture, it says. And, you know, in some versions, Obadala lived down the street. There's other versions where Obadala lived uh, downstairs and Ogun lived upstairs, vice versa. They lived in very close proximity to each other. And Obadala would hear this, uh, this clanking of the chain when Ogun would perform consultation. And this would great, greatly bother him. He was an older gentleman and, you know, it, it, it just really, uh, it really bothered him. So another thing that was happening was, is that Ogun was dedicating more time to his art of divination and, you know, learning how to do a bow and performing sacrifice that he stopped producing metal implements, tools and weapons, right? Because of it, society kind of slowed down. People had needs that weren't being fulfilled. Certain icons weren't able to be constructed, etc. And Obadala went running to Orumila saying, hey, um, I don't know who you asked or uh, spoke with before doing Ifaru Ogun, but um, we have an issue. First off, he's annoying me with the sound of his chain, and you know, the Opong and everything's made out of iron. Um, I can't stand that. And apart from that, you know, things are not being made. So I don't know how you're going to do it, but um, he needs to start focusing more on the making of tools and his uh, being a blacksmith and, you know, being an awo. Orumila was a, a little, you know, disheartened by this because Ogun was showing a lot of uh, aptitude for learning the arts of Ifa. He was a good ball out, um, you know, and unfortunately, at least in Afro-Cuban tradition, the story goes that Orumila took away his implements to avoid being cursed by Orishanla. Um, there's other versions where, you know, he told Ogun, um, you know, you have to focus more on being a blacksmith, etc., and, you know, this greatly frustrated Ogun. There's other versions where Orumila took away the tools until Ogun learned a balance between, you know, being a blacksmith and being an awo, etc. But if you look at the gist of the story, um, you know, a lot of people interpreted the story, story saying that because of this, Ogun or his children should not be Baalaos. Now, mind you, if someone is a child of Ogun and they do have the Odu Iroso Tu Alara in their hand of Ifa, the conversation I would have with them is, you know, you want to make sure you're fully prepared for this priesthood, whether it be the study, whether it be the sacrifice it takes to learn, making sure you're not taking away from any of your other obligations, etc. But it was based on this that the sons of Ogun received the stigma of not being able to do Ifa. Now, mind you, do I agree with that? Me personally, no. I do believe that any man that has the characteristics and apart from that, 
you know, the capabilities of doing Ifa should, whether they're children of Ogum, you know, I'm even at the point where even the children of uh, Bawalwaye, um, you know, that's a whole nother stigma and a whole nother conversation. But once again, if Urumila has identified the person as being a candidate to become a Bawalawo, you know, the guardian Orisha is with that. Because to be able to provide an Odu of Hand of Ifa, Urumila conversed with the Orisha Alabatori to be able to provide that Odu and destiny to the person. So even if the person is Iroso Dualara, even if they're a, children, a child of Ogun, you have the characteristics, you have the desire, and as long as you tell me, Baba, I'm going to do whatever it takes to learn Ifa, regardless of guardian Orisha, destiny, what have you, you're ready to go. Now, the same way there are Odus that speak of the stigma um, with Ogun possibly doing Ifa, I think it's outnumbered by the amount of Odus that speak of it positively, Right? So many different signs. I mean, even Iroso Tualara or Iroso Atere, as it's known in the uh, Isheshe practice, you know, it speaks of this famous verse of where Ogum did Ifa and, you know, the Esefa where, you know, his implements were taken away or, you know, they weren't utilized as much. He still was a Baalau. He still was initiated. And, you know, eventually he did continue his practice. If you look at the positive Odus that speak of the initiation of the children of Ogum into Ifa, um, one of them is Obesa. Right? There's a verse in Obesa where Urumila prepared to initiate Ogun into Ifa, and it went positively not only for Ogun, but for Urumila, right? Other Odus that speak of the contrast or stigma are Odus like Baba Ida Temeji, where even though studying it and looking at the Patakis that are pertinent, once again, these are very loose interpretations. And what we have to be very careful with is that we're not interrupting or frustrating somebody's destiny based off of one story and one interpretation. I mean, I know numerous sons of Ogun who are initiated as Babalawo and they're very proficient. Um, some of the famous examples of this um, are Ogumwande Abimbola, the Awise Awo Abaye, or the representative of Yoruba culture in all of the world. Uh, Mr. Abimbola is a, a practitioner of the cult of Ogum, or, you know, that is his Orisha. Um, apart from that, I have heard that Kundo Sevilla, or Facundo Sevilla, um, Awo Bedi was a son of Ogun as well. And, you know, anybody who knows of Afro-Cuban Babalaos and the lore of Ifa and Palmira and all these different places, you definitely know who Kundo was. And he was a very competent, apart from being Babalao, Osainita or, or Omo Osain, right? So very, very competent people, great examples of, uh, you know, Babalaos that, you know, were children of Ogun. Um, the same thing with the children of Oya. The same thing with some of these more obscure Orishas who aren't necessarily given the golden path to Ifa, like maybe us, the sons of Oshun, or the sons of Shango, or the sons of Obadala, or the sons of Eshu. But, um, you know, in, in Nigeria, they really don't have these stipulations. And then I'm not saying that we need to base everything off of the way our uh, Ishesh and Nigerian brothers do it. But at the same time, if there's nothing impeding the person and apart from that they have the desire drive and diligence to be great Baalaos, i don't think we should impede them based on their guardian orisha everything is based on their odu of ifa right so it speaks of that apart from that when we're talking about ogun in isheshe practice ogun is kind of like the best example of masculinity he's hard working he's pretty organized you know he has this stigma in the afro-cuban tradition of not being the brightest when in reality, Ogun was at the forefront of the furtherance or, uh, you know, progress of humanity. I mean, when we're talking about the blacksmith, we're talking about the superstars of, uh, you know, uh, ancient society. They were the Bill Gateses. They were the Teslas. They were the Edisons. They were the Steve Jobses of, uh, of society. They were inventors. They were innovators. And Ogun, being the blacksmith, was that. And... There are scripture, I have read things where said Ogun was the first Baal Hour, one of the first people that Orumila initiated into Ifa, you know, based on the fact that with his uh, blacksmith skills, he was able to confection so many of the tools and icons that go into the practice of Ifa, whether it be the, uh, the Ada Orisa, the knife, uh, the numerous metal icons and tools that are used to represent our faith. Um, you know, it even speaks of the disciples of Ogun who were Amosun and Amorum. Right, who were also blacksmiths, you know, or, or you know, and, and if if you know a little bit about Nigerian culture, Yoruba culture, you know, every blacksmith, it's not that they're priests of Ogun or necessarily, uh, you know, followers of Ogun, but they definitely give homage and honor to Ogun. And when we look at Ogun's disciples, they did the same thing to him, and that did not interrupt Orumila, our Messiah, from initiating them in Ifa. So when we're talking about the priesthood of Ifa, you know, we kind of have to go to the source, who is Orumila, and if Orumila saw fit 
to do ifa to all of these countless orishas um, and their children, whether it be Obaluaye, whether it be Oya, whether it be Ogun, who are we to say otherwise, especially when there's scripture um, to, uh, to say that it's okay. Now, of course, you always want to respect your lineage. You know, tradition is, uh, is, is just as strong as lineage and, and scripture. So it's very important to get with a house that is willing to understand your specific situation and provide you with the information to show you whether it's a positive action or a negative action. And then at that point, everybody has to make their own decisions. But um, if you ask me, the sons of Ogum, just like the sons of any Orisha, based on their uh, capacity as a, a man, their characteristics as a man, and as a priest, and, and you know, that desire and drive and, and, and will um, have the right to do Ifa, uh, you know, based on their conversation and interactions with their elders and everybody understanding what's involved and obviously the brothers that are working the ceremony. So guys, there you have it. Whether or not the sons of Ogun can, uh, can do Ifa and become Babalawos, apart from the other Orishas as well, you know, we provided some information. You guys are more than welcome to, uh, you know, come up with your own opinions on how to move forward. Any further questions on this video, please feel free to uh, put it in the comments as you've been doing. Uh, Botanica Candles and More uh, appreciates you. Joseph Baba Ifa appreciates you to schedule consultations as well as possibly get one of these uh, amazing Orisha drip shirts. I got a Elegua shirt here with the nice uh, sombrero that is usually seen in with the drip. Uh, BotanicaCandlesandMore.com is the place to visit, right? So guys, we really appreciate you. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like, share, comment, and definitely subscribe. New videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday. And uh, sincerely from all of us here, Take care, guys. Have a blessed day.